Okay, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to Upland Hunting 102. Uh, just a few things to take care of before we get started tonight. Uh, you will not need your webcams on, so you can leave those off for now. And you will also not need to turn your microphones on at all. So you can just sit back, relax, and enjoy the presentation as we work through this PowerPoint. If you do have any questions throughout the presentation, you can put that in the chat box where we uh, announced that we'd be starting at seven o'clock. So you can just respond to that and we'll see that. Either the presenter will answer that or someone, uh, one of the other presenters will answer that in the chat for you there. So uh, if, uh, if our audio cuts out at all, you can't hear anything, you put that in the chat so that way we know you can't hear anything, uh, anything else like that. You can expect to get a recording of this email to you in the coming week or so. We do send these out to get some uh, closed captioning put on them. So that takes a little bit of time to get them back, but we can send this to you guys. Uh, if you registered for any of our webinars, you will get a recording for it and also the PowerPoint that we used. Uh, so you can leave your webcams off so that we don't, nothing pops up and leave your microphones off so that there's no extra background in, uh, noise as we're going through the presentation. So, uh, yeah, and then you also receive a survey. So please take those surveys, let us know how we did. Uh, if there's any information that we did not cover yet between 101 and 102 that you still feel you need to know, uh, just a heads up right now, we do have the Bird Dog 101 coming up. So register for that if you're interested in hunting with a dog. And on these presentations, we're happy to partner with Pheasants Forever. So there's their contact information there and we'll be showing you this again by the end of the presentation but uh, they're one of the great organizations. We'll talk more about them going forward in the, pre in the PowerPoint. But uh, if you're interested in doing some volunteer work and trying to do some habitat work in Illinois, uh, look at your local chapters and you can sign up to help them out. Our course today, uh, we're gonna talk uh, about pheasant habitat and then we'll go into Bob White Quail habitat. And then we'll talk about how to, some strategies on hunting. So how to play the wind and how to play the weather uh, to make sure you're more successful than not when going out into the field. And then we'll talk about uh, trying to get birds up and flushing the birds, and then trying to find places to hunt and hunt planning. And then we'll end with some bird processing. And today we'll actually have uh, a live bird process in front of you guys, so that way you guys can see how to process a bird. Uh, so our, pre our presenters tonight are gonna be uh, Dan Stevens. Dan, would you like to say hi real quick? Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you. And then myself, Jason Buckley, uh, we're with Illinois Learn to Hunt. Uh, and then again, uh, we do have some people visiting here with us. So our guest speakers tonight is going to be Katie. Katie, would you like to say hi real fast and tell us, uh, you guys are both, Katie and Dallas are both with Pheasants Forever. So Katie, uh -huh. if you just want to talk about Pheasants Forever and what your role in the organization is. Yeah, sure. So, um, hi everyone. My name is Katie Koslich. Um, I am the Illinois Outreach Coordinator. So my job is to work with um, the 60, we have about 63 to 65 volunteer Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever chapters. Um, so I work with them to put on outreach programs. Um, also work with our staff to do programming um, along with our partners. So um, working on basically getting as many people out in the field, putting as much habitat and um, getting everybody out and going. So I'll let Dallas talk a little bit more about the habitat side of things since he is the expert on that and I'll turn it over to him. E evening everybody. Uh, my name is Dallas Glazik. Uh, as yeah, Katie said, I'm a uh, Farm Bill uh, wildlife biologist located in East Central Illinois. And my role is I work with uh, both landowners, farmers, and uh, other recreationalists to uh, improve habitat uh, and uh, install uh, government habitat programs such as CRP, EQIP, CSP, and as well other ones such as the Habitat Chapter Grants or uh, any uh, a person just wanting to do it on their on themselves uh, here in the great state of Illinois. Awesome, thank you guys both for joining us tonight and giving us your evening. We really appreciate it. And again, uh, so this, this PowerPoint is gonna be slightly shorter than some of our other ones. So we will have some time at the end for any questions you guys may have about pheasant hunting or pheasants forever, uh, quail forever in Illinois. So if you have any questions, again, if, you, if we're not talking about it and it's not topical while we're going through it, if you have any questions for these guys at the very end, they're, they've said they'll stick around and, and help us out and answer any questions we may have. So to get us started, Dan, I think you're gonna start us off and talking about some upland game birds here. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Jason. 
Um, yeah, so this is our Upland Hunting 102 webinar. Um, for those who, who took Upland 101, uh, the first few slides here will be a, a little bit of review, uh, but we're, what we're really gonna focus on today is understanding the behavior and the habitat use of some of these upland species. And as we progress through this webinar, you'll, you'll start to understand how important habitat is to, to not only sustaining these populations, but also to the way we hunt and to where we hunt. Um, so obviously just a quick overview of upland game birds. Um, the, the two most popular upland game birds in Illinois are the, the ringneck pheasant, as well as the, the northern bobwhite. Now, both of these species are what's known as ground nesting birds. And so what that means is, you know, they're, they haven't evolved and adapted to, to have strong flying muscles. And so they spend a lot of time on the ground. And again, that's why some of the habitat is so important to, to where these birds um, reside. And so ground nesting birds have, have this kind of chicken-like appearance. Um, they have these rounded body and blunt wings. And as, as I kind of mentioned, they're essentially reluctant flyers. Um, they, they don't like to fly, but they certainly can if they, they feel they need to, to escape predation and things like this. But typically they're gonna spend the majority of their time on the ground. Um, they are fairly well adapted to regions with cold winters. Um, as you notice, it, it says in parentheses, with suitable habitat. And so that's really important as we kind of progress through this, you, you'll start to realize how important a lot of this winter cover habitat is to, to managing the, these species in a, in a manageable population. So a little bit of background about the, the ring-necked pheasant. Ring-necked pheasants are, are not native to Illinois. They are a species that's native to Asia that were first introduced into Illinois in about the late 1800s. Um, there wasn't very successful reproductive efforts by the pheasants at that time. There just wasn't the, the number of birds as well as the habitat until about the 1950s is when you really started to see um, ring neck pheasant populations um, really start to, to blossom. Um, pheasant population or pheasant hunting in Illinois specifically began to really increase in popularity in kind of the, the 60s and 70s. Um, in the 70s, there was actually years where they averaged over 250,000 pheasant hunters per year. Um, and so that's a, a substantial amount of, of hunters. And just due to, to degradation and loss of habitat, um, we've started to, to see these populations uh, beginning to decline. I um, mean, you, you saw that large scale decline really start in about the 1970s. The Northern Bob White um, is, a, is a species of, of ground nesting birds that is native to Illinois. Um, quail hunting was extremely popular through the mid 1900s um, with well over about 150,000 hunters per year in Illinois. Um, and we're gonna quickly play the, the vocalization of the, of the Northern Bob White. So this is a quick headphone warning. You may wanna turn your volume down just a hair uh, because the, this call might be just a little bit loud. Um, so Jason, if you could go ahead and play that vocalization. And so that is the, the Northern Bob White whistle. And you can see kind of where it gets its name from. It sounds like it's saying Bob White. Um, and so that, that's where that, that name comes from. And you'll hear that vocalization a lot um, kind of in the, in the spring as they're starting to, to nest and starting some of their mating behavior. Uh, but again, this is a bird that's very similar to ringneck pheasant in that we saw the, the same kind of population decline um, in about the, the 1970s. And so here's a, a quick illustration just to show how stark these population declines are in these, these separate species. And a lot of it is just due to the, the landscape level changes um, that, that started to happen over time. The 1950s, when these birds were really abundant, um, we had these really small and diverse farms. Um, so back in the, again in the 50s, you had multiple family farms that were you know, on average 30 to 40 acres in size. But now we have kind of the, this, this rise of modern agriculture that started in about the 1970s that started to remove fence rows and pastures. Um, waterways were converted from cool season grasses. And we also saw more efficient farming equipment. Um, so that left less, less waste grain on the ground. And that's an important food source um, for a lot of wildlife. But with that, I'm gonna quickly turn it over to Dallas and he's gonna discuss some of the efforts that are underway um, to, to restore um, some of these, these habitats. Yeah, so uh, there are uh, a lot of government programs have actually come across to uh, increase uh, habitat, practices, quality, and soil health. 
from the landscape. The, the degradation uh, was clearly noticeable uh, by effects of the Dust Bowl and stuff like that is whenever uh, these organizations got established. And uh, there has been a rise of wild populations once uh, these programs got, in, got installed. And uh, most particularly noticeable was an increase uh, in a particular CRP program called CP42, which is the pollinator habitat. Uh, and a lot of that is uh, bringing back more native prairies uh, with a high density of forbs. Uh, and I believe it goes over uh, later on, uh, but a lot of that is you're uh, increasing the number of insects back on the on the landscape in order for uh, chicks, which consume 90% insects, uh, and then you get a lot of uh, uh, adults consuming insects for the higher protein. But that the uh, CRP is not the only one. Uh, it is probably the most common that I work with in the area. However, we do have uh, EQIP and CSP as well. Uh, those are typically viewed as more uh, your soil health and water quality uh, based programs. However, uh, uh, you can accomplish really good uh, habitat management through those, uh, one of which being the CSP uh, program that focuses in on monarchs uh, and really uh, increases the diversity on the landscape. You can go ahead and continue on there. Yeah, so here we have uh, the slide kind of touching up on CRP, the Conservation Reserve Program. It is a cost share and rental payment program of the USDA. Uh, the cost share has been fluctuating here recently and they've landed now it is 50% of the cost of establishment. And then the rental rate is dependent on your top three soil types uh, that are looked up there at the, at the USDA office. And the whole point and the goal of it is uh, to reimburse the cost of taking that marginal ground out of production and turn it into a, a habitat or a conservation practice that can really improve um, uh, taxpayers' investments and in, in, you know, use of wildlife and, and stuff like that. So yeah, so uh, they take ag ground. It has to be uh, previously cropped ground. Uh, this cannot be ground that was uh, uh, established as a hay field or uh, in a prairie uh, already. And so, yeah, it has to be ag, ag ground and they convert that uh, over to a vegetative cover. And uh, there is a wide options. Um, like I said earlier, the CP42 is a pollinator one. They're up to 43 different CRP practices that range from uh, wetlands to uh, riparian areas, uh, trees, uh, prairies. Uh, you name it, there's there's uh, definitely an option out there. And then uh, the contract that the farmer or landowner uh, signs to keep that within that particular practice for a length of time. Uh, and that's uh, 10 to 15 years typically in length. Uh, they have just added on a 30 year uh, practice here just this year actually. Uh, and then with uh, requirements within the contract for options such as mid-contract management uh, and which are vital to keeping uh, the habitat value of that particular area uh, high quality and not letting it be overrun by invasives or uh, turning into a further secession. Uh, however, that's not the only option. Uh, the government programs, while beneficial, uh, do not affect every single piece of land here in the state of Illinois. And so that's why our uh, Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever chapters, we actually uh, have chapter grants and as well as uh, volunteers in the area with uh, good seating equipment uh, to get out and get more, more habitat um, on the landscape. A lot of these uh, uh, chapter projects are gonna be focused in on your uh, marginal pastures or uh, uh, fence rows or corridors. Uh, which are becoming really vital um, whenever it comes to connecting these larger tracks that are in CRP or a state wildlife area of getting corridors so uh, so these birds can move in and out of your your uh, ag landscape uh, safely and and, um, and swiftly. So yeah, so if you look at the map here, uh, we are located all across uh, the great state of Illinois and broken up into uh, northern and southern 
areas. Uh, southern areas are going to be predominantly more quail focused, uh, as that is uh, tends to be the more more populated region. Uh, and then the orange areas are your uh, areas that are a little more pheasant focused. And uh, there in my area of Ford County, we happen to be right on the line uh, between the north and south and have uh, two, two chapters in uh, the counties surrounding me. Uh, those are um, both the Champaign and McLean County Pheasants Forever chapters, and then as well with uh, University of Illinois and Illinois State University Quail Forever chapters. So uh, we have a wide range if uh, anyone's in a particular age group or uh, looking to, to get involved. Excellent. Thanks, Dallas. Um, and, and just a, a quick caveat to add on to that. Um, I, I think the, the real highlight with the, the Pheasants Forever kind of chapter locations is really critical to, to getting involved in upland hunting. I know when I first started hunting, finding like-minded hunters and, and engaging with, with people with the same passions and the same interests um, is, is hard for a lot of people to, to meet individuals, again, kind of in that, that same lifestyle. And so joining these organizations can not only, again, you can benefit by, by providing volunteer time, but it's also a great way to just meet um, potential mentors or other like-minded people that you may um, you know, go on a hunt later on. So it, it's definitely worth looking into to joining some of these, these organizations. But now we're gonna kind of dive right into to the bulk of this presentation. And like I mentioned in the intro, it's gonna be very habitat focused. And we did that with kind of a, a specific design in mind. Um, the, the way we hunt upland birds is, is very dictated by the habitat that's present on the ground. And so we're going to go over some strategies and how to identify the best habitat to hunt and then how to actually get in there and hunt that habitat. Because there are a few things to keep in mind as you begin, you know, hunting these areas um, that the habitat is going to dictate maybe how the birds flush, um, whether the birds flush early, whether they flush late. And so those are a lot of the things that we're going to discuss. Um, today. But first, we want to go over the, this quick um, season outlook. So this is a document that Illinois DNR puts out annually. Um, they have a specific upland outlook for pheasants, um, for quail, as well as rabbits. And so this gives a, a quick overview of, of what the conditions were like during the nesting season, what some of the bird counts look like. And so it just gives a, a quick illustration of what you can expect um, from the, the upcoming upland season in terms of, of population numbers. Um, so obviously the, the 2019 to 2020 winter was a relatively mild winter. Um, so that means winter mortality of these birds was likely low. However, the spring did bring about some above average rainfall, which has the potential to impact some of the, the early nesting attempts, particularly of, of pheasants. Now, the good thing is pheasants do have the ability to, to try in a second nest. And so what, what this year showed was, you know, those hens that attempted a, a second nest had good success. Um, overall, the 2020 conditions were good for quail um, during their, their peak nesting and brood rearing season. So that, um, that gives us some, some good information to, to kind of focus on for this year that both the pheasants and quail seem to have decent um, and, and productive nesting seasons. So again, just kind of a quick intro into this habitat section. It's going to seem tedious at times, but again, I promise if you make it through the entirety of the webinar, you will see how a lot of these pieces start together. And understanding habitat use is, in my opinion, one of the most influential decisions that a hunter can make. Um, whether you're hunting squirrels, rabbits, deer, waterfowl, being able to, to decide where the, that specific species is, is gonna be crucial to, to how you plan your, your hunting efforts. And so now we'll start right in. We're gonna first start off with, with the pheasant. Um, so pheasant have, have you know, some, some very specific habitat requirements. The most important is grass fields. Um, as you can see here, I, I use the, the term native warm season grass. Um, that, that's not technically a requirement, but that is you know, becoming more and more common in some of these restoration efforts is this concept of native warm season grasses. But essentially any tall grass prairie um, it is good. And we'll, we'll get into some more specifics in a little bit later. But also agriculture, agricultural areas intermixed with areas of taller vegetation. So as we kind of described a little bit earlier in the, you know, the 1950s, we had these real small parcels of land that had, you know, fence rows and hedgerows basically surrounding them that were just kind of unmaintained. Those made absolutely amazing habitat for pheasants and quail. 
but this concept of, of grasslands, and this is particularly for, for pheasants, this is where you're going to spend the majority of your time hunting is, is in these grasslands. But it's really important to understand the characteristics of the grassland to make it appealing and suitable um, for pheasants. So again, these grasses can be CRP, um, that, that conservation reserve program that Dallas discussed a little bit earlier. Um, they can be native remnant prairies. There's not a ton left in the state, but there are um, a few. They can also be hay fields uh, or just kind of overgrown fallow fields that just have been kind of unmanaged um, for a while, but also windbreaks or fence lines with unmowed grass cover. Um, so as, as we kind of mentioned, you'll very oftentimes you'll see these fence rows that are starting to, you know, just, just turn into this brush thicket, but very oftentimes they have kind of a, a grass layer underneath and that can provide um, very good habitat for, for pheasants. Arguably the most critical and imp important component, uh, component of, of habitat use for pheasants is this concept of heavy cover. And this is one that, that can pay off dividends as a hunter is focusing a lot of your efforts on, on heavy cover, particularly as temperatures drop and maybe it's real cold and rainy or even snowy. You know, the, these heavy cover areas provide that, that ability to, for the bird to, to thermoregulate and to, to feel safe. And so these brushy edges, again, just create this ideal winter cover. And I, I heard this slogan, oh, I was probably, you know, six or seven years ago, but it, it was this whole concept that upland habitat is, is rough around the edges. And that's really stuck with me because as you see, it's not just these big open prairies that, that are advantageous for these birds. They need multiple types of, of this growth. And so they need the grasslands, but more importantly, they need this heavy, heavy cover. but they also need food sources. Um, obviously there's kind of an abundant supply of food in a lot of these areas we've discussed, uh, but Illinois, like most of us know, it's kind of a, a corn and soybean, you know, Mecca. So it's kind of a, a virtual buffet in that, that sense for birds. So agricultural areas, whether it's corn, um, soybeans, if, it, if it's kind of smaller grain, like your oats, wheat, and milo, um, those, are, those are really appealing um, to pheasants. And these field edges, provide they, they provide kind of a, a mix of, of native forage as well as as some of the you know the supplemental from the corn or soybean and so pheasants and quail are, are what are referred to as an edge species and so that's essentially species that that like the intersection between two habitat types and so in this instance it can be an agriculture field that butts up to a prairie or an agriculture field that butts up to uh, maybe an overgrown fence row they really like that edge and again that edge just provides a lot of diversity in terms of food, but also a lot of cover. So how do we find good habitat? What's, what's really important to, to remember when you're thinking of, of upland hunting, it, it's not like, you know, deer, where eventually you can go sit in the woods and at some point a deer is going to walk by. If the habitat is not conducive and the birds are not there, Again, the, these, aren't, these aren't migratory species that are traveling, you know, miles and miles and miles. Um, you know, the daily activity of an individual pheasant typically is conducted within one square mile or less. Um, obviously, the, you know, the, the better the habitat is, the smaller that home range becomes just because it doesn't have to, to travel as far to these different habitat resources. Uh, but they, they, you know, cover a, a fairly small area. So finding these areas that have an abundant food source that have this grassland cover, but also this woody kind of heavy cover um, is extremely important. But it's also important to understand the overall behavior of, of pheasants and how they utilize these, these different habitat types. Um, pheasants are gonna feed early in the morning and then they're going to retreat to cover during kind of the, the middle of the day. And then they'll go on that, that end feeding pattern. So if you're going out for a morning hunt, you're going to want to focus again on these field edges, um, whether it's a, it's a grassland next to a ditch or a crop field that's next to a prairie or a crop field next to a, a hedgerow. Again, the, these edges seem to hold a lot a lot of birds. Now, as that day progresses, you're going to want to shift more interior into that cover. Um, and we'll explain that in a little bit later when we get through some, some diagrams and some strategies. But there's a lot of overlooked habitat in some of these areas just because of how small the cover may look. But if, if the cover's correct, the birds are gonna be there. Now we'll quickly go over uh, Northern Bob White habitat needs. Um, it, it, 
this is kind of a, another slogan that I find fairly appealing. Um, good quail habitat is usually good pheasant habitat, but good pheasant habitat is not always good quail habitat. And what this means essentially is that that quail are a little bit more specialized than the pheasants are. So obviously the pheasants need that, that grassland, they need the food sources, what, as well as some of that heavy cover. What you'll notice is quail are very specific in the type of woody cover um, that, they, that they need. But first of all, again, the, the major component of this habitat use by, by Bob White is gonna be in these grasslands. And it, it's really important to, to understand the overall structure of the grassland. Um, these, are, these are tall prairie grasslands that are what, what we kind of refer to as bunch or clump forming grasses. So if you think about your yard that may be in fescue or zoysia or some of these other kind of sod forming grasses, if you were to walk out there, you see basically a kind of a flat mat of grass right along the ground cover. And if you can imagine a, a, a chick quail that, that kind of just hatches out, out of the egg, they're about the size of a, of a bumblebee. And so if you can imagine that little chick trying to, to walk around in that grass and look for seeds um, to feed on, it's darn near impossible. And so these clump forming grasses have this unique tendency to almost form kind of a, a maze at the ground level where you have this exposed bare soil that allows them to, to easily search for seeds. But at the same time, it has this nice vertical structure that kind of goes up and flattens out and essentially conceals them from any avian predator that, that's kind of flying overhead. And so that's the, the real important part of these prairie grasses is that, that overall structure. But very similar to pheasants, this concept of woody cover is extremely important for quail. Um, you can have a grassland that is about as ideal for quail as possible. If you do not have this woody cover present on that site, chances are there's not gonna be any quail there. Um, this, this is a, a habitat type that is basically a requirement um, for them to, to be able to make it through the winter. Um, and as again, as we kind of mentioned, the 1950s was kind of a, a perfect heyday for, for quail because you had these big, you know, agricultural fields that they can thrive in, but they also were kind of broken up by this nice woody cover um, that kind of surrounded those areas. Now, quail can be found in the interior of grasslands. But again, if that suitable woody cover is there, typically they're going to be on the edge because that's where the woody cover is going to be. Uh, but occasionally you might find some of these fields that do have kind of an interior woody structure. Um, a lot of ecologists and kind of hunters call these covey headquarters. Um, and we'll kind of show you a good illustration of that on the next slide. So this is kind of what a, a covey headquarter looks like. And if you're not familiar with the term covey, um, we'll cover that in, in the next slide that kind of details some of the, the covey behavior. Um, but again, the, this concept of, of shrubby cover is, is critical for Bob Whites. Not only does it allow them to escape predators, but it also is critical wintering cover. It allows them to, to kind of thermoregulate themselves, uh, to get up off the ground, but also to, to get around in there and search for seeds. Um, typically, you're going to want to find areas that have about 10 to 20 percent of shrubby cover. And so if you're in a, a big grassland and there's just no shrubby cover nearby, chances are there's not gonna be an abundant um, you know, size of, of, of quail population. And typically the, these thickets are going to be essentially low growing thickets. You don't want them to be, you, know, you don't want tall trees. They're gonna be fairly short trees that you're gonna be seeing. So very often that's gonna be your sumacs, uh, maybe some roses might be thrown in there, but think more of kind of bushes um, and shrubs rather than, than kind of trees um, growing. But again, this creates that sparse ground cover that, they, that allows them to seed search, kind of like that, that whole concept of the clump forming grasses. It still has that ability to get down underneath, find bare ground and begin looking for, for seeds. Now, I think this is one of the, the coolest aspects of upland hunting, uh, particularly quail, is, is being able to see an active cubby. And so uh, quail are extremely social and particularly in the, in the fall and winter, you're gonna see them in these groups um, of about three to, to 20 individuals. And that's going to be termed a covey. Um, so it's a, a covey of quail. So it's essentially a group of quail. Um, and again, the, the size of the, of the covey can range anywhere. You know, I've seen 
like this, this slide illustrates, you know, anywhere from three to four birds, but I've also seen coveys up to a couple dozen. Um, so again, it, it can vary. But the, the whole concept of covey, as you can see in this bottom picture here on the right, that when they sleep, they're actually going to sleep in a circle. And so they kind of tuck all their butts up together and kind of face outward. And so not only does that give them the ability to, you know, keep an eyesight for, for predators, but it also allows them to, to further thermoregulate themselves amongst each other. And typically when you're, you're hunting quail, um, th this kind of top picture is an illustration that you're going to see far too frequently. And it's a lot of fun when you kick up or, or flush your first or second covey. Um, but it, it provides a unique adaptation for the bird. And it, it's something that we as hunters should be aware of because we fall victim to this just as much as any natural predator does. Um, and it, it's this whole concept of, of flashing or, or mobbing. And so if you were walking around a prairie and you kick up an individual quail, it's very easy to, to pick up your shotgun, to hone in on that specific bird and to make an accurate shot. When you have 15 or 20 different birds all jumping up and flushing at the same time, you have kind of this flashing effect and you have this moment of, of almost panic where you just go back and forth between birds. And, the, and this you know, whole concept of covey comes from that same adaptation in the wild. So when, they, when a predator flushes them, they get confused and it causes just enough pause for that predator that it allows them to, to get away. And so keep that in mind as you do quail hunt, it, it's very hard to convince yourself to pick an individual target and focus on that one individual bird than it is to, to kind of flock shoot or shoot the entire cubby. And so just kind of be aware of that. But the cool thing about the, this concept of, of cubby is it gives us as hunters a unique advantage into how we can find birds. Um, and so there's this call or this vocalization that Northern Bob White do called a, a cubby call. And it, you can kind of sound, it almost sounds like it's coy lee, coy lee. Um, we'll quickly play the vocalization. This is kind of a, another headphone warning, um, just in case your headphones are up a little bit loud. Can you go ahead and play that vocalization, Jason? <coughs> and so that's the covey call. And essentially the covey call is, is used to announce to other coveys that, you know, this covey is here. And it allows the coveys to kind of space themselves out across the landscape so that they kind of reduce overall competition for, for food and cover. But what it also does is when you flush a covey, um, chances are that covey is gonna be broken up and they're going to go in separate direction. After about 30 to 45 minutes, they're gonna start covey calling and trying to essentially reform that original covey. And that gives us a unique advantage um, as hunters because we can start to hone in again on where that covey is located. But this can also be a, a really useful tool for us in terms of scouting. Um, so early in the morning and, and kind of fall and winter, you will hear covey calling pretty much constantly if, if you're in an area where there are, are quail populations. Um, it, it, so it's, it's one of those things you can just go out and listen to a prairie, hopefully start to pick up on where these, these coveys are actually located. And then hopefully you can put a plan together um, to, to go in and, and hunt those areas. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Jason, and he's going to discuss kind of hunt planning, and he's going to go over some new resources that DNR developed, um, and then we'll we'll kind of take his, you know, his, his talk here and, and take it into the next steps, and where we're actually going to go over some diagrams and, and kind of how we would hunt that specific area. Thanks, Dan. So we're going to build on what we talked about in 101. We, I mentioned this, if you're with us uh, last week, and uh, so this is the new uh, reference that you can use from DNR that came, with this, that came out with this year is huntillinois.org. And you can use this to find public land sites and uh, to also find a couple other tools. Again, if you go to the homepage, there's about a 10 minute um, tutorial about how to use the website and the different tools that they put on this. And I highly suggest if you haven't checked it out yet to go check it out. And uh, it might answer a lot of your questions before you have to go to the old DNR website or call a, a biologist or a site manager. So we're gonna start off with uh, where do you wanna hunt? So for this one, we're gonna do a specific site. And for this, we're gonna look at Moraine View. So I put in Moraine View, and then that's gonna give you a couple of things. So it's gonna give you uh, the site specific regulations. 
so if you if you tab, tab down, you can look down at the site specific regulations. This is what traditionally was on the Hunter fact sheet. And I was told that the most up to date information on any site right now is going to be here because they just entered it's a brand new website. So of course, it's going to be the most up to date. They just entered all this in for for reference. So you can go here and then it has the different species that you're interested in hunting uh, and they all have drop down tabs and then you go upland bird and this gives you all the information about upland bird at that site so this one has walk-in and it has all of the specific regs on walk-in and they also have the controlled pheasant program down here so you can look at those and you see which states they're open and the times and check-ins and times checkouts and uh, if it's a walk-in if you need a windshield card and then you can click that to go print off your windshield card so this is a great reference compared to um, previously where you might have to go to several different web pages and try to get all this information. Uh, they have put it all here uh, for you to have an easier access to try to be a legal hunter and going on to these public areas. So then it also has a site map. And if you go to the site and you have to search the site and it'll take you to it on the site map. Um, and then you can click on the species that you're interested in hunting in and you can click pheasant and then it will show you the range on that property where you can hunt pheasant at. So then you can turn that off so that way you can get a better satellite view of that habitat. And then you can use this map to kind of give you an idea of where the parking lots are at and have an idea where you want to go. So that way you can plan uh, depending on wind direction, maybe you want to, if it's out of the north or south, whatever, uh, you might want to hunt a different field. And we'll get into that in a couple slides here. But you can just find a parking lot. And I believe what I zoom in on is going to be this field right here. So then you can find this field. And then for, from here, you can look at habitat and kind of plan how you're going to walk through the different fields. Dan's going to kind of go over the strategies on walking through fields and, and how to use that and dogs and wind uh, here in a second. So I think we can build off of this, Dan. Go ahead. Perfect. And before we, we dive in, I do want to, again, reiterate the safety, um, and as, especially as, as we're, you know, walking through a field with, with firearms. Um, so if you can advance to the next slide really quick, Jason. Um, there's a few key things to, to keep in mind in terms of safety. First of all, we always need to know where our, our other hunters are if we're hunting in, in a, a group or in a party. But one of the big things to, to keep in mind and to, to keep reiterating to yourself is your pheasant hunting is to make sure that bird is high enough in the sky um, that nothing is in front of or beyond your target when you pull that trigger. And so the way I like to think of it is kind of like this illustration at the bottom shows is when I see blue sky beneath that belly, um, that's going to, again, let you know that, that it's high enough um, and that you can take that, that safe shot. But it's also important to, to know where you are on the line and to know what your zone of fire is. And so this is kind of a quick illustration just to show zone of fire. It's basically kind of a pizza slice in front of you. You will have some overlapping shots um, with, with some of those, those other party members, uh, but just remember your, your safe zones of fire. And so now we're, we're going to dive into to how do we put all this together. Um, one of the, the, the more important aspects of, of upland hunting, in addition to understanding the habitat, is understanding how the weather impacts these birds. Wind speed, direction, and weather can all impact where the birds are and how they react when flushed or how they react at all. Sometimes they may not flush. Um, and so we'll go over some strategies on how to actually force them um, to flush. But again, cover present also impacts upland bird behavior. So if it's real windy, um, that can cause the birds to, to hold tire. It might cause them to just sit on the ground and kind of let you walk right by. Uh, maybe you're not hunting with a dog and that dog doesn't go on point at that bird. Um, it might cause them just to, to either sit longer before flushing or they might just sit there and not flush at all. When the, when the birds flush in windy conditions, you can expect them to essentially try to catch the wind. So they're typically gonna flush into the wind so that they can use their wings, catch the wind, and then they're just gonna take off. Um, and so that's kind of why we, we typically try to hunt into um, the wind. And so here's a, a quick illustration that, that kind of shows how important wind direction is. 
Um, again, when a bird flushes, they are typically going to want to fly into the wind direction. So typically when we're pheasant or quail hunting, we're going to want to hunt into the wind. Um, and knowing the wind direction can also help you estimate where the birds are gonna go um, once they do flush. Um, again, they, they like to catch the wind and, and try to escape it as quickly as possible. And so being able to predict which direction they're going to, to flush to um, can be important to you on the line. If you're hunting with a dog, it, it's very important to, to be cognizant of the wind direction. Um, again, you want that, that scent of the bird to be blowing to the dog. Um, if it's blowing in reverse, that makes it really difficult for the dogs to start to pick up on the location of the bird and to pick up on that scent. So having that wind direction blowing the scent of the bird to you as, as hunters and to the dog um, is very advantageous for that dog being able to, to locate the birds. What it also allows for is a, a stealthier approach. Um, so, so when birds are, are just kind of resting on the ground and sitting there, they're, again, they're on red alert pretty much 90% of the time. They're always looking for, for predators. Their ears are always listening. They're always looking. And so having the, the wind kind of in your face allows you to have a, a, a little bit of a stealthier approach. It allows you to be a little bit quieter um, as, as you're kind of moving because the wind's not essentially blowing your sound directly to the bird. And so again, a lot of times you'll notice if the wind direction is incorrect, you may have birds that are flushing, you know, 80 to 100 yards in front of you. And very often that's just simply due to the fact that they can hear you. And very often it's because the wind's coming from behind you and blowing that sound um, directly to the birds. Now, if you are forced to hunt with the wind at your back, there are instances where you may not be able to, to get around it where you may just have to have to hunt with the wind at your back. Um, typically what I would recommend is to hunt the, what you identify as kind of the, the least productive areas. And so when I first either decide on a property that I'm going to hunt or, or I get there that morning, I always like to sit down and, and look at satellite imagery and look at what the habitat actually looks like out there. And I, I'll try to find the, the higher productive areas and set myself up so that I can hunt those higher productive areas with the correct wind direction. And so in this instance, it can be really good to, again, use the wind at your back to hunt the least productive areas. Um, that way, when you kind of set yourself up to the really good areas, you have the, that correct wind direction. But there are also weather considerations. Um, warm weather may cause the birds to, to flush a little bit easier and quicker. Um, so typically in warmer, warmer days, you're going to want to focus on areas with shade. Um, so that might be some of those heavy cover areas along the, the edges that we talked about. Um, if you can go back to the previous slide, just a second, Jason. Um, one thing, this, this is kind of a, a very common field that you're going to see in Illinois, especially on public sites, are these kind of, you know, strips of, of prairie with, you know, kind of overgrown fence rows splitting up fields. The majority of birds on a site like this are going to be found along those edges. Um, so very often you'll see a lot of people just kind of walking straight through the middle of the field. Focus on those thicker, heavy cover areas where the birds are actually more likely um, to spend a significant amount of time. Particularly again on these warmer days where they're gonna wanna you know, get in some shade and cool off, it's very common to find lots of birds in these, these kind of overgrown thickets. Now, if it's cold, that can cause birds to, to sit a lot longer before flushing. Um, in some cases, it might even cause them to, to not flush at all. Um, it, you know, again, if, if they feel safe in their specific location, they are not going to flush. Flushing is kind of a, a last resort um, for, for upland birds. It's not something they like to do because it gives away their position pretty quickly. And so if they have the ability to either run or just kind of hunker down, that's, that's very common. And if this, this is kind of, this goes back to the whole concept of, of, of the importance of habitat. So if the habitat is, is really unproductive and it's not great for holding birds, that's going to cause the birds to flush a lot sooner because they don't feel as comfortable or as safe in that specific holding spot. Now, if the habitat's really good, they feel cover, um, there's a lot of woody cover around and they feel safe and secure, they're a lot more likely to, to sit there longer until they kind of get to that, that point of, of almost no return where it's like, okay, I feel like I'm, I've been seen, I have to flush now. 
But what's what's very common is struggling to get these birds to, to flush, uh, particularly if you're hunting in some of these controlled pheasant sites, um, birds will be reluctant to flush. But also, again, if you're really high quality habitat areas, if you're not hunting with a dog or if you're hunting with a dog that's maybe, you know, not as well trained or not as well um, kind of, you know, scented, it, it's going to make it a little bit tougher. And so it, you might struggle to get these birds to, to flush. And so there's a few strategies that I wanted to highlight that, that can help get these birds to, to flush and help you find more birds. Um, the first one is don't stop short. The second is pause. So incrementally walking through the field. Um, strategy three is zigzagging through the field. And each of these strategies will have kind of a, a quick illustration and a slide on. But um, strategy four is to, to work the cover and hunt small patches. So don't just focus on, you know, the, the big open grass in front of you. Think about some of the higher quality areas of habitat that may be in that big open grassland. Also, slow your pace. And most importantly, watch for runners. Um, like I mentioned, flushing is kind of a last resort for a lot of these birds. And so it's very common to see pheasants and quail kind of running um, ahead of you. And so you want to watch for, for those birds. So strategy one is don't stop short. So make, I know this, this seems fairly obvious, um, but as you get out in the field, it, it's very common to just get, you know, within 15 yards of the end and say, okay, let's go ahead and rotate around. But as I mentioned, flushing is kind of that last resort for the birds. And so very commonly, they're just going to slowly either walk or run ahead of you um, until they get to kind of the edge of that, that field or the edge of the habitat that's there. So working all the way up to the edge, very oftentimes there's going to be lots of birds kind of tucked in that, that very end of the field. Um, I had, I've had several hunts where the only birds that I kicked up, you know, that, that specific day were in the last, you know, 10 feet of, of that field. And again, that's just because these birds are just slowly walking or running um, away from us as hunters instead of flushing up. So make sure that you kind of hunt that entire field and don't stop short. Another really useful strategy um, and it, this is something I, I do, even if I'm not, you know, struggling to, to get birds up in the air, it's to, to pause and to, to hunt incrementally. Birds will often hold tight when they hear hunters kind of moving at, at a steady, consistent pace, um, especially on some of these more pressured public sites um, that, that, that get a lot of pressure. These birds start to pick up on kind of the nuances of hunters, that a lot of hunters are just going to walk at a consistent pace, and it doesn't really give them that that feeling of actually being, you know, stalked or being hunted. Um, and again, they probably don't view us as, as, you know, oh, we're out there hunters, but as being as predated. And so these irregular intervals and kind of, you know, remaining silent for, for several seconds, a lot of times that can finally make that, that reluctant bird, he may just all of a sudden flush when you just kind of stop silent. He may think he's been seen. And so having these kind of irregular, inconsistent movements and pauses um, is, is a great strategy um, when you're when you're upland hunting. Now, arguably, my favorite strategy when I'm hunting a field is to work in a zigzag pattern. Now, this is again goes back to the the, the safety briefing we had um, a little bit ago. Is that when you're doing a zigzag pattern, you really need to be on your your A game um, with your safety. You need to always be looking left and right and making sure you're in kind of a, a safe line and no one's kind of straggling behind or getting in front of other hunters. But the zigzag patterns is, is really good for not only A, covering a lot of habitat, but also it again breaks up that, that normal consistent, you know, walking path that, that these birds have, have seen over and over again. And it kind of, again, makes them think they're being stalked. They're seeing this irregular pattern, there's pauses, and so being, you know, working in a zigzag pattern is really advantageous um, to, to upland hunting. And this is one of the, I think the, the more important, I think one of the overlooked aspects of, of upland hunting is focusing on the, the cover and the, hunting the, the small patches. And so maybe you're hunting, you know, a 640 acre grassland field. Well, if it's just all kind of this, mo you know, this monoculture, of just even grasses, if there's an isolated pocket of either shrubs or, or other thickets and woody growth, those areas very oftentimes will hold birds. 
And so a lot of times I'm looking for habitat differences. If, if you just look out there and everything's consistent, look for where those differences are. Uh, maybe there's a shallow dip in a field that, that tends to hold a little bit water. Chances are that's gonna impact the vegetation that's growing in that specific area as well. And so these are the kind of things I'm looking at when I'm going through the process of, okay, how am I going to hunt this field? Is just looking for those, those essentially outliers in that field um, can, can be really advantageous. And also slow down your pace. Um, I know when I first started pheasant hunting and, and upland hunting as a kid, we, you know, you always see these birds running ahead of you. And your first instinct is, well, if they're running ahead of me, I need to move faster to catch up to them. But very often when you're moving faster, all you're going to do is either cause those birds to continue running or they're just going to simply freeze and let you walk right by. And so work at a, at a reasonable slow pace. You don't need to do a, a brisk kind of fast walk, just do a normal slow walk pace again pausing and having these irregular intervals um, can, can cause those birds to, to feel threatened. Um, again, because they feel extremely safe in that specific area. I, I like to relate it to deer hunting. So if, if you're you know, walking through maybe a real thick area where you expect a buck to be bedded, if that buck feels safe in his bed, he will let you walk within five feet of him before he finally takes off at the, the point of no return is where it, he's finally made that decision like okay I feel like I'm, I've been caught I've been noticed it's time to escape and so the birds are that that same way so if they're very secure in that specific area just kind of adjusting your pace essentially makes them think oh they found me and that can oftentimes cause a flush as well And the last strategy and something to, to really pay attention to is, is runners, uh, particularly with pheasants. Um, pheasants are notorious for just running ahead and trying to evade hunters without flushing. Um, and if you do see this, that's kind of a, a good indication that either you need to rethink your wind direction, you need to maybe rethink how you're hunting that field, and probably you need to slow your pace down a little bit as well. Um, but when you do see the, these pheasants kind of take off running ahead of you, note where they're going to because chances are they're going to an area that has that that heavy cover that we discussed earlier um that that's again an area they feel safe and secure and so when they're running in these grasslands typically that's where they're going to be running is to find that these areas of, of heavy cover where they can kind of hunker down and feel safe and so note where that that cover is and then after a few minutes kind of continue hunting the field towards that area but then make sure to push through that heavy cover and, and to hunt that heavy cover and chances are um, you'll, you'll, you'll find that bird in there. But again, when you do kind of reposition yourself to, to hunt that cover, you want to make sure that the wind direction is blowing from the bird to you so that you can kind of have that, that stealthier approach without all your scent, all your, your sound blowing straight to the, straight to the bird. I'm going to quickly turn it back over to Jason. Thank you, Dan. So, uh, that's going to uh, conclude the strategy portion. Now we're going to talk about processing a pheasant. And Katie has some birds thawed out, and she'll be showing us how to at least breast a pheasant. Uh, she's willing to possibly even pluck some, but that's up to her. Uh, but we put this in here just so you will have a resource to go through the steps of how to clean out a pheasant if you haven't before. Uh, so this is going to be the skinless method. Uh, the benefit of this method is that you don't have to pluck your bird. So you can go through these steps. I won't read a slide off to y'all, but uh, it basically just goes through how to, uh, you start with the feet, then you take off uh, the head and so on and so forth. And you can take the skin off pretty easily. Um, you barely need a knife to do so. And uh, you just take the skin off and um, then you clean out the insides through, uh, it talks about making a slit underneath the breastbone, which this is the end of the breastbone here. And just make a slit and you can actually go in there with about two fingers and pull all the innards out, wash your bird off. And it's pretty simple. You can get this done in a couple minutes per bird and uh, pretty straightforward. Then our other method is a pluck method. And the benefit of this, depending on what you wanna do culinarily, is the skin would be on. So again, similar method, just uh, when you get down to the bottom here, similar way of, of taking off the head, the feet and removing the innards. But uh, you just go through, pluck all the feathers off. You go against the grain, pulling up towards the head. And again, uh, the biggest tip on here would be look out for BB holes because as you're plucking, you don't wanna rip your, your uh, skin. So that way it just 
visually, it looks a little bit better. So BB holes make a weakness in the skin. So be wary of that. Uh, you also want to get your BBs out. Uh, I have had pulled, I think it was pulled goose last year, and uh, that I've been into a BB in my pool, my pool goose sandwich. So whenever you're hunting with BBs, just try to be mindful of that. Uh, so yeah, so again, uh, you can read through this when we give you guys the PowerPoint and uh, follow the steps, you'll be able to clean your bird out. And right now we have a actual visual of this. So Katie can take over and uh, show us how she's gonna clean her bird. So can everybody see my screen okay like that? We'll kind of happen to figure out a fun way to do this in my office. This is definitely one of the weirder things I've done in here. Um, so with cleaning a pheasant, usually the first thing I think of when I you know, have my pheasant is you know, how you clean it, you know, there's more than one way to clean a cat or skin a cat, they say the same with a pheasant. Um, you, your way you're gonna clean it is going to be a little bit dependent on how you wanna cook it. Um, so I'll show you guys the most common method um, that I see the most. Um, with a lot of pheasant hunters, the most common way is to take the breast out. Um, so what you do with your pheasant, as you said, um, if you are doing this with wild pheasants and you are transporting them, so if you clean them out in the field, um, you do need to, when transporting them, have some way to identify them if you get pulled over by a CPO, a conservation police or game warden. Um, so some people will leave a wing on when they're cleaning. Uh, most people will leave a foot on. Um, this is especially easy um, since if you hunt in wild birds, the only birds you're supposed to shoot are roosters. Um, so you have that spur, um, feathers don't get in the way, it's easily identifiable. Um, so pheasants, unlike some other um, bird animals, is got a very, very thin skin. So you can honestly, when you take a bird, what I do is the first thing I will actually do is take off a foot right here. Um, you can either do this with a sharp knife or some game shears. Um, most people kind of do a combination of both. Um, unfortunately, I don't have my sharp shears with me, so I'm going to be using a, a pretty sharp knife. Um, you can bend these and right there at the end, kind of where your elbow would be, if you do a cut in, is a tendon that kind of loosens it. And you can crack it and they can kind of twist off or you can just kind of take a knife and end up cutting them off. Um, I am going to leave that one foot on. And then I usually will remove both wings when you pull it right where the wing meets the body. So right at that V, I'll just do a quick cut, kind of crack it a little. Do that to the other wing too. And I'm gonna do this like I'm doing it out in the field. So I'm gonna leave that one foot on there um, just to kind of show you how I would do that. Um, most people and what I do with most of my birds is I do skin them all. Um, so You'll look at the breastbone, there is a kind of a ridge. This is the keel. That's where all the flight muscles attach. Um, it's very pronounced on them. And it's usually compared to other birds, like ducks have a little bit thinner skin, but not pheasants. I'm hoping this will do it because it's an old bird. Some of them, if they're fresh, you can just pull that skin apart. This one's been in the freezer for a while. It's not doing that. So you can just take a knife or a scissors, get that skin started. And once it starts going, you can just pull. And it's going to come back and expose that breast meat like that. Now, for some people, what they're doing is they're just push this all back. So you just have the breast exposed like that. And they're just take a knife and go right down the edge of this all the way and just kind of work along the edge of the bone. And they'll just peel the breast out that way. Um, I personally, though, I like to use the leg meat a lot. Um, I'll usually cook the breast in their own type of, you know, I'll have a certain dish for them. And then I'll save up the legs throughout the year and I'll make them as in a soup or use them that way. So 
you just kind of keep on working, pull it down one leg. And as you see, the skin does not stay, it's not tight on there at all. Once you get it going, it usually comes off real easily. So with the leg on the foot, usually you can just pull it straight off and kind of like a sleeve. That one got stuck a little bit, but that will work. There you go. And then keep on pulling, kind of come around to the back. Now I don't do too much with the butt part of it. Some people were actually um, save these, pluck them out, save the feathers. Usually just take a good uh, knife or a good shears, cut it right off. And then keep on pulling that leg. So I've got the legs in the front done. I just pull the skin up the back. Got a little bit attached there, pull that off. And you will see there are some feathers that stick to the skin. That's okay when you wash it at the end. There's um, a good idea to have a bottle of water or some out there. You just pull it all the way up. And you come up to the head, which is coming over the wing joints right here. It got a little caught. Now, once you get to this head portion, I'm going to pull that a little bit more. Got your neck, you just take a knife, cut right through, and you got a pheasant that has been skinned out. Um, when it comes to then taking out the guts of it, there are two different ways that you can do that. Um, so I've actually got two different pheasants. I plucked or cleaned one before. Um, these guys were little guys, so they've got a lot of feathers sticking to them. They've been in the freezer for a while. The first way, um, and this is the most common way I see it done, is when you open the pheasant up, you're going to see this keel that we started where it ends, it starts getting soft. So you just make a little incision right underneath there, and then you pull to separate. Now this is going to be where it gets gross if you don't like guts. And you just reach inside, Usually two fingers is enough. Kind of hook it in and you pull. And that will pull out all the guts. You do want to be careful when you're doing this. Um, you want to make sure you get all the way up there. Um, you want to check the side of the rib cages. The lungs can sit in there. Um, this is actually their heart. Some people really like to save those. Um, I personally have never tried pheasant heart yet, but I know some people think that it's great to put it in skillets. Um, but that's the first way you can gut it. The other way um, is you take a pheasant, and this is kind of good if you want to spat cock it or cook it flat, not like that. Um, so instead of doing it from the front where the breast was, we're going to do it from the back. This is going to be one where you're probably going to want a little bit better kitchen shears than what I have. Right now, but you're just take your scissors and you're just going to follow each side of the backbone. You're going to go all the way up. Then you do it on the other side of the backbone. So you're basically just like a spat cut chicken, you're removing the backbone from it. And you pull all the guts out that way. So. so those are the two most ways that I see these pheasants cleaned. Um, some people, what they like to do, and it's a definitely a lot more time consuming, is pluck them. Um, so when you're plucking a pheasant, some people like to do this, especially if they're going to roast them whole. The skin helps keep the moisture in a little bit better. Um, I did want to show if you got, this is what your end product, you definitely want to clean up this butt area a little bit more, but it does give you a good visualization. Um, when you're plucking a pheasant, 
a few things to be wary of. Um, it's got very thin skin, as I said earlier. So if you've got any bullet holes or any places that the pellets have went in, you want to definitely be careful around those areas because the skin is more likely going to tear. Um, most people, when they start plucking, they say to start from the back. So um, one of the things to do is you don't go with the direction of the feathers, you go against. So, and you want to do it as a quick motion. So they do come out fairly easy. Um, I'm not going to do this whole one because it is a very messy process. I do not recommend doing this inside if you are going to pluck a pheasant. Um, but you would start with the back. You would do the legs or the wings. The legs, the legs are the easiest. Um, and then they suggest ending with the breast and doing that. Um, the skin is a little bit tenderer there, so it's more easy to tear and you're more likely to have problems. Um, when you are plucking a pheasant, sometimes you might find, I'm not sure if anybody can see these right now. You see those dark little spots right here. I'm not sure if you can see these. This is um, common, something you might find a lot in young birds, so especially in the early season. Um, these birds were killed about a month ago, um, and so they weren't actually mature yet. So they've got a lot of pin feathers, these tiny ones. Um, it's just feathers that have, immature feathers that haven't came in. Um, there's nothing wrong with them. It just is a pain to get these off more. So um, there's really um, not a lot of, you know, not a lot of wrong ways to clean a pheasant, luckily. Um, I do see on Facebook and YouTube a lot, the videos where people are, they put the pheasant on the ground, they put, they spread the wings out, they stand on it, and they pull the legs, and that's supposed to be a way to skin and clean and get the breast out of a pheasant really quickly. I don't like that personally. I can't do it. I'm not coordinated enough. Um, so usually when I'm doing pheasants, I am cleaning them out. Um, this is my usual way. I skin them out, I gut them, and then when I take them home, I'll remove this leg, and then I will break them down and use the legs for soups. And then I'll use the breast for some of my uh, fancier recipes that I do um, that way. So Dan, or um, do you guys have anything else or any other ways you want me to show? I do have two birds here that I haven't broken down yet. No, that, that that's fantastic. And, and, and like Katie mentioned, when you're, you know, after you harvest your birds, it's really important to, to at least have an idea of how you want to prepare um, the, these birds, because that's a lot of times that's going to dictate how I'm going to process it, like she mentioned. So having, you know, at least some rough ideas of how you're going to utilize the meat later on um, can at least give you some some guidance into to how you're going to do this. But the, the main thing here, uh, particularly with pheasants, is getting that, you know, the internal organs out as fairly quickly as possible. Um, the, the warmer it is, the, the more likely that meat is going to spoil. And the, the, the main reasons that we're field dressing um, game in general is A, to remove bacterial contamination from the gut and from the intestines and the fecal matter, but also there's a huge source of meat in, in those intestines. And so if you just kind of feel your body, you know, feel your gut, there's a, a lot of heat trapped in there that's, you know, all those organs are about 100 degrees Fahrenheit, if not warmer. And so getting that, that source of heat out of the body ensures that that meat's gonna start to cool down rather quickly and can preserve the, the wholesomeness and the quality um, of that of that protein. And I, I do have one thing I forgot to mention about plucking a bird. Um, if you're gonna pluck a bird, it's usually easiest if you do it, you know, very, very quickly after you hunt. So if you go out in the morning, you shoot a pheasant, it, it's cool and you don't need to break it down because of spoilage is fast, you know, in the winter and you take it home and you wait until the evening to clean it and you wanna pluck it. They actually um, say that that is not great if you don't, you know, pluck it relatively a couple hours after you kill it. Um, they say to let it sit another day or two to dry hang it and age it. I'm not a huge fan of that method. I haven't tried it. It's just a mental thing with me. I know a lot of people swear about hanging and aging their meat. Um, but like Dan said, I, it, the spoilage, you know, if it gets too warm or you're hanging them and you're doing it outside and you have like a warm morning and a cool evening, it's just that little bit of time to get some spoilage on it. So um, so you don't want to leave a bird and shoot it at nine o'clock and wait to pluck it until five o'clock because you're going to have a lot of skin tearage. Um, it's not impossible. I mean, this guy, he's been frozen. He's still kind of solid, but I was able to get it through it pretty good. I did have a little bit of tearage, but it's a messy process, but it, it's worth it. 
It, it certainly is. And if this is, you know, your first exposure to upland hunting and, and maybe this seems like a, a daunting task, you know, when you get your first bird, just know that, you know, at, at this stage, there's not a, a whole lot that you can do to, to ruin the meat. Um, field dressing is, is kind of the most important where you don't want to, you know, nick the intestines or, or any of those other organs. Um, but, but once you get to the point where all the guts are out, then it's just simply, you know, getting the meat off the bone. And there's really no wrong way to do it. Um, you know, there, you might want specific cuts or, or things like that, but as long as you get that meat off the bone, you'll be able to use it at some point. Well, excellent. Thank you, Katie. No problem. All right. That was an awesome job, Katie. Thanks so much. Um, so that's going to conclude our webinar for tonight. I just want to go over a couple loose ends before we get out of here. Uh, first off, thank you all for joining us. And again, if you're interested in Pheasants Forever, here's their contact information. I highly uh, suggest that you reach out and see if you can be a volunteer or a member of a chapter. Uh, and again, if you have any questions for Learn to Hunt, you can reach out to us, uh, email us through our website or through Facebook. So you can message us through Facebook at any time and we'll get back to you in a timely manner. And we will have time for Q&A. So if you have any questions about Pheasants Forever or pheasant hunting or upland hunting in Illinois, please put them in the chat. And again, uh, the conclusion of our Upland series is gonna be Bird Dog 101 on November 5th at 7 p.m. So you can register for that the same way you registered for this course if you haven't yet, and we'll be happy to see you all then. And again, we'll have some guest uh, speakers for that one as well. And I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. That's our first bird dog one. And I personally have a spare spaniel and I'm happy to learn a little bit more about that. And we can all debate on which breed we like the most. And so with that, uh, also just to, okay, before I, we move on to questions, uh, if this is your first interaction with Illinois Learn to Hunt, uh, we are a workshop organization previously uh, to COVID. We have moved on to webinars and online content, but one day we hope to get back to these soon. So if you want to follow us on Facebook or our website for all of our postings of our events, you can see when we get back to doing these workshops again, hopefully next year. And if you don't have time to do a webinar and you want to work through something at your own pace, we do have e-learning modules on our website that you can go to at any time and work through those. Those cover topics such as waterfowl, deer, turkey, and upland hunting 101. So again, just some resources. And again, uh, please email us or message us at any time. If you have any questions, we are a resource for you all. So with that, if you guys have any questions, you can put them in the chat. And if you're going to leave, have a great evening. Uh, looks like we have a, a question from Kyle Hoffmeister. I apologize if I missed this, but could you talk a little bit about hunting upland without a dog? Um, yeah, that, that's a that's a, a fantastic question. When I first started upland hunting, uh, you know, I, I really don't have a dog at this point either. I, I have a golden retriever who sometimes thinks she's an upland dog, but she's certainly not. Uh, but but typically, when I'm hunting without a dog, what I'm really trying to do is again focus on those areas that have really good habitat. Because um, again, we don't have the, the nose of the dog that's going to be able to, to locate where those birds are. So what I like to do is focus on those high probabilities um, where I expect birds to, to be resting. And so typically, again, that's going to be along edges. So those intersections between two habitat types. Um, and typically, they're going to, to skew a little bit more on the heavy cover um, side of things. But the, the big thing without a dog is to just, A, cover much ground as you can. Um, and and Another really important thing to highlight, uh, particularly at a lot of the, the public DNR sites that you may find yourself upland hunting, they're gonna have a lot of mowed paths through the, the upland field. So they'll have you know, tall grass prairie with some kind of mowed strips through that, that prairie grass. Um, while it, it's real enticing to, to simply walk through the, those mowed strips, um, you will not find birds walking through there. So the only way you're gonna flush birds without a dog is by essentially scaring them up. And so again, get in the, the thick of it. Um, and you're going to have to, you know, traverse some, some thick country. You're going to get prickers and briars. But again, that's where those birds are typically going to be found. Um, so if you're walking through a grass and field and you happen to stumble upon, you know, a little shrub thicket or maybe a big rose patch, um, try to hunt that rose patch. Try to get in there and, and maybe make some noise or kick, kick the shrubs a little bit just to, to, again, try to stir up and look for anything in there. But typically when I'm without a dog, 
I'm focusing on where I expect the, the birds to be. Instead of covering as, as much ground as, as you can with a dog, um, again, I'm gonna try to focus on those areas that are a little bit more, more probable. Um, and, and Dallas or, or Katie, um, feel free to, to chip in if, if you have any thoughts on that as well. No, I, I pretty well agree with everything that you were talking about on, you know, it's definitely easier with, with a dog, but there are times when, when you've got to go it without one, so. Yeah, and you know, that that's a really another good good time to bring up the, the Pheasant Forever chapters. Um, I, I know it sounds like we're kind of beating a dead horse, but when I first started duck hunting in Illinois, um, you know, I didn't have many decoys, I didn't have a, a dog, I didn't have a boat, I didn't have some of the requirements that are necessary you know, to, to have a good experience. And so what I did is I just went to some of these organizations and, and tried to meet more people because a lot of times you may have access to a, a specific property or, you know, in, in the event of a, a pheasant hunt, you may have drawn a pheasant permit for a really good site. Um, well, that gives you the opportunity to bring in a few other, other people. And so having those relationships and building those relationships, you can say, well, hey, I have this field you want to bring your dogs and we can come hunt together. And that's, that's a really great resource and a really great way um, to build those connections, but also to, to try to get out there with, with a, a really good bird dog. Um, I would, I would also suggest um, not only Pheasants Forever, but reaching out to uh, North American Versatile Hunting Dog Association. If you're looking for people with dogs, a lot of them have dogs that, you know, they, they like to run and they like to train, but, they might not be interested in so much shooting the birds. They might be more interested in focusing on their dogs and working with their dogs. Um, so they, you know, they run with the pointers. They're a great group. We use them at a lot of youth hunts. So that, that would be another group that I would recommend reaching out to if, you know, you're looking for some help with hunting and a dog. I don't know very many hunter guys that are going to turn down a free walk-in permit or a free hunt. Right. that one. <laughs> <laughs> So I did see uh, Shelly asked, Dallas, um, looks like you shared some resources for her to look at with um, West Central and Southern Illinois. Um, I, you know, there are a couple also hunting preserves in that area too. You can find those if you Google hunting preserves in Illinois too, um, which hunting preserves are obviously a lot different than hunting wild birds, but sometimes if that's all you, you've got as an option that it works well. Um, I've hunted preserves quite a bit because um, sometimes that's that's all you got. So, oh, and Forever Field, thank you, <laughs> Dallas. Um, that is another site that that is not in West Central. That is in, uh, or no, that is West Central. Um, so West Central Illinois, um, in Victoria, Illinois, Pheasants Forever has um, a 508 acre property, um, which is also caddy corner to a walk-in site that the DNR has called Buffalo, um, Buffalo Grass Prairie. Um, you do need to check the site regs for both those. You can find um, Forever Fields regulations at www.ihuntil. So not Hunt Illinois. It's, we have very similar websites. So www.ihuntil.com. We mentioned it earlier. Um, that site does allow walk-in pheasant hunting. Um, we do have, it is lottery only the first two weekends of the season, um, but we do allow walk-in uplands. Um, we allow archery deer, um, snow goose hunting. We've got a lot of duck hunters. Um, so that is a place that you can go walk in. Um, we do just warn people when you do go there, it was former strip mine ground. So it is a little bit rougher walking. Um, it's not going to be going like to some of these state sites where you have the mowed paths. We, we don't have that. We're trying to well, managing for the birds, not for the hunters. So. Excellent. Uh, we had another question from Jeremy, um, and essentially he asks, you know, looking for resources to, to hone in his shooting skills, uh, particularly at kind of moving targets. Um, and that, that's a fantastic question. That's one of the, the biggest barriers to getting into upland hunting is, you know, the ability to, to be competent with your firearm. And there's a lot of good resources. Um, you identified one being the Pheasants Forever chapters. They very often have, um, you know, outreach wing shooting uh, clinics. And I'll let, I'll let Katie kind of uh, discuss that in a little bit. Uh, but there's a really good program called the Illinois DNR Wing Shooting Program. Um, now with COVID, they did reduce the amount of, of, of programs they, they currently offer. But what they, what they have is an up, or not an upland, but a, a wing shooting hunters class. And essentially it's designed to 
um, mimic real hunting situations and hunting scenarios um, with, with your shotgun. And the cool thing is you're typically in a group of two or three individuals um, with a, a certified wing shooting instructor kind of right next to you, giving you tips and, and giving you pointers and giving you kind of, you know, overall structure in, into, you know, how to improve your, your shot. And, you know, I, I grew up shooting high school trap and skeet, you know, shooting moving targets. Um, but I, I've taken a few of these hunter wing shooting clinics. And even though, you know, I thought I was a competent shooter, I was not. Um, and, and having that, that, you know, really good instructor standing right next to you um, and kind of addressing a lot of the things that you can't see yourself um, is invaluable. So I would recommend checking out the Illinois DNR um, hunting, hunters wing shooting clinics. Um, I think they're about $30, but that does cover the cost of your ammunition that day. Um, so typically you're just kind of, you know, purchasing your ammunition. Uh, but it is, a, that's a really good resource. You're going to get to shoot a lot of ammunition. I think I shot almost a hundred shots um, at, at the one I attended. And so it's a great resource. Again, you're going to see different, you know, presentations. You might have some coming to you, some coming away, some will act like a covey of quail flying up in front of you. And so it's really just to mimic those, those real life, you know, hunting, hunting scenarios. And I, I would second what Dan said, um, I, I'm a DNR wing shooting instructor um, as well with Dan. Um, most, probably about 80% of those clinics are sponsored by our Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever chapters. We've got tons of um, individuals that are Pheasants Forever volunteers who decided to go through the training to become um, instructors because it does, um, it, there's a lot of things, you know, sometimes great shooters are not the best people to teach you how to shoot because they've done it so long and they're so instinctual. Whereas these instructors are taught how to identify problems, how to fix it, um, what to look for when a shooter's having certain problems. Um, so very big fan of the DNR wing shooting program. Um, they did a great job creating that. Um, but uh, we do have a lot of chapters right now. Um, unfortunately, COVID-19, um, we did have a pretty big decline in the amount of outreach events that were going on this summer and um, this fall. There are a few chapters that are doing some youth hunts right now, but most of the chapters um, are not doing them. What I would suggest is um, reaching out to Dallas or I, um, letting us know where your location is. Um, if we have a chapter that's active, our, the way our chapters are structured is they're allowed to keep any money that they fundraise. So the only money that goes to Pheasants Forever is our membership dues that you pay. Um, and everything else, if you go to a banquet, any money that's raised, they get to keep. So they then get to decide how to spend that money. So we have some chapters that are very, very focused on outreach, getting new hunters out there, doing shooting. Um, and then we have some chapters that are very, very focused on habitat, you know, helping landowners, um, doing projects that way. So depending on where you're located, our resources are going to be different throughout the state because it really is dependent on the type of volunteers that we have and what the volunteers specialize in. So reaching out to us, letting you know your location and um, we will try to hook you up with somebody. And we got a lot of the chapters that are starting to take people out, especially now that we can't do events. Perfect. Um, we had a question from Dave Montgomery. Uh, HuntIllinois.org is the best place to start when you're looking for areas to hunt. Um, yes, that, that is definitely one of the, the better resources out there. Um, another thing that, that I'll, I'll quickly mention is, you know, Illinois is 90% privately owned. Um, and so there is a lot of, of private land out there. And a lot of times, you know, just knocking on the door and asking permission um, is, is a great way to, to get started. Uh, particularly with, you know, upland or, or small game hunting, there's a lot of deer hunters in the state. And so a lot of these private land probably already have a deer hunter that's using them um, or, or something like that. So being able to, to start with, with small game can really help you build rapport with that, that specific landowner. Um, and and that, that's a, another great, great option there. Another thing to look into is look into some of the county municipal districts. Um, I know they don't typically advertise them heavily, uh, but there's a lot of little county you know, parcels of land that the county owns. And in a lot of cases, they're open to hunting. Um, I know that McLean County in Normal, they have, they have some, some public hunting um, at Kamalara Park. So there's a lot of different options um, out there. Um, there would be one more. Uh, there's not a lot of sites yet throughout this. Um, most people are using this for um, 
for deer and turkey, but um, Illinois Recreational Access Program has um, started including a few upland sites that people can apply for. It is, um, priority is given to youth and first time adult hunters, um, but there, this is such a, you know, unknown program. Most of the public doesn't know about this program yet, so it's not getting utilized. So a lot of times the sites don't get taken up. So even if you've hunted before, there is probably a better chance you could get an IRAP site than you can some of these um, lottery sites, especially the, the good state lottery sites. So. <laughs> And another option too, um, we, we cover it quite a bit in, in Upland 101, uh, but don't be afraid to look into the controlled pheasant hunting program that, that's run by the, the Illinois DNR. There's off the top of my head, at least eight or nine different sites across the state that have these controlled pheasant hunting operations. Um, now with COVID, they are kind of restructuring a little bit the, the way that those are run. Um, it sounds like there's going to be no standby permits and you're going to have to reserve your spot online ahead of time. Um, but, but those are a great option as well, particularly if you're, you know, a, a new hunter, um, that's, that's another great way to, to meet a lot of hunters um, while you're out there. Um, and we did have a question asking about um, shotgun recommendations. Um, I saw Dallas answer that um, in, in the chat um, and, and my thoughts kind of follow along the, the same trend. Um, you don't need the most expensive firearm out there. You just need one that, that you're comfortable and that you're competent with. Um, and I will plug again, the, the wing shooting program here. If you are brand new to, to firearms, it's a, it's a great way to, to be able to try out different firearms. They typically have a few there um, that you can utilize and, and try out. So you can start to you know, understand what to look for um, and, and kind of what to expect to the shotgun to feel like in your hand and to feel like you know against your cheek and different things like that. Cause it's really important to have that shotgun um, like Dallas said, that, that fits and that you're familiar with. Um, yeah. But again, the, the shotgun I go back to every time is a, a Remington 870 pump that's fairly cheap, um, fairly inexpensive, and it's one of those I don't care if it gets scratched up too bad. Um, so, And that's that's also what my, my husband uses to hunt is a Remington 870. Um, so that that's a great example. You know, the gun doesn't have to be Great. Um, I didn't hunt until I started this job five years ago and I had, you know, the old time pheasant hunters telling me I had to do it with an over-under. I had to get a side-by-side -side, and that's not true. I go out with um, a 12 gauge um, Weatherby and that is a semi-automatic. So I, you know, the best thing is if you can have people let them try your guns, um, if, especially if you're a woman, um, sometimes the guns are going to fit us differently because our bodies are designed differently than men. We have longer necks, we have shorter arms, we can't carry as much. Um, so I usually, when I go pheasant hunting, I, I'm almost usually shooting a 12 gauge because I also duck hunt. So I like to have a gun that can go back and forth. But if you're going to be um, pheasant hunting, um, most people hunt with a 20 gauge. Um, quite a few people hunt with a 12 gauge. Um, I know a few people that do um, four tens and 28 gauges. Uh, those, you got to be a little bit better shot with those because they don't have as, you know, they pattern a little bit differently and don't have as much of oomph to them. So um, that, unfortunately, everybody asked that question that it's, there's no great answer. It's um, trying out and finding what you like and what feels comfortable when you're holding it. Yeah. And, and also another thing to bring up is also think about the other species that you might be interested in hunting. Um, if, you know, like Katie mentioned, 20 gauge is a fairly popular, you know, upland gauge. But if you're interested in maybe goose or turkey hunting, you may want something that, that packs a little bit more punch. So a 12 gauge might fit better um, if you plan on hunting some of these other species. So just kind of be thinking about what else you want to hunt. That way you don't have to purchase multiple firearms. You can just, you know, purchase the one and it can kind of carry over um, to multiple, multiple species. I think we are caught up on all the questions and um, we'll leave it open for a few more minutes to see if any other questions trickle in. Well, uh, with that, I think we'll go ahead and conclude tonight's webinar. Um, a huge thank you to, to both Katie and Dallas for, for spending their evening with us and, and sharing some of their insight.
Um, we hope you guys enjoyed this, this webinar. Again, if you are interested in, in learning more about, you know, utilizing it in a, a bird dog, um, we are going to have some really good speakers at the Bird Dog 101 where we're just going to go over some of the basics um, in terms of, you know, a training regimen and some things to, to look out for. Um, so again, if that's something you're interested in, um, go ahead and register. But other than that, uh, thank you for joining us and have a wonderful evening.